By the way, um, I did a podcast interview about two weeks ago. Yeah. And I found out this morning that the person who did it deleted the file. So uh, I'm hoping you've, you've, you're you going to record this properly and not lose it. <laughs> I hope so. Welcome to How Brands Are Built, where branding professionals get into the details of what they do and how they do it. I'm your host, Rob Meyerson. Thanks for listening. Today, I'm talking to Jonathan Bell, Managing Director of Want, a brand consultancy with offices in Miami, Denver, and New York. Jonathan has about 30 years of experience in the branding industry. During that time, he's completed over 800 projects and worked with over a third of the companies in the Fortune 100, companies like Google, Apple, Coca-Cola, Mercedes-Benz, and Disney. He's also a visiting professor at Wharton and a frequent conference speaker, including a 2016 TED Talk, How to Create a Great Brand Name. You should definitely check that one out. We'll link to it on the site. Jonathan has some really clear, straightforward thoughts and advice on naming. I think you'll find his point of view interesting and hopefully helpful too. Here's the conversation. Jonathan, I'm so glad you could join me. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. So I just rewatched your TED Talk from a couple of years ago, and it gives a great overview of how you think about naming. But today I want to talk more about process. So what does a typical naming process look like today at Want? Great question. Um, well, process is absolutely critical to success. And I make that point quite clear to the client because Ultimately, their objective is to get a name and to do it normally as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. But I really can't sort of overstate the importance of getting a good process. Mm -hmm. And there are different parts to that because, you know, really there are four fundamental steps, I would say, to creating a great name. The first is creating a brief. Um, we have a process that we call, um, it's about, we call it naming blueprint, and it sounds quite fancy, but it's actually quite simple. You know, there are three key parts to the blueprint. Number one is some kind of bullet point criteria for what you want the name to communicate. And some of those can be broad and general, like obviously it's got to be easy to say and talk about, but some of them can be a bit more uh, precise and perhaps a bit mundane. You know, if someone, if a client doesn't like the letter Z or X, you know, we can actually put that in the list of criteria. So that's the first part of the, the blueprint. The second part is the name types. And obviously in my TED talk, I talked about the seven different fundamental name types and what the pros and cons are of those. We help the client understand where they want to be there. And then the third part is really understanding what we want the name to communicate because fundamentally names can only really say one or two things off the bat. Obviously greater meaning is imbued over time. Once you start to build a brand, you develop a logo, perhaps even do advertising, social media, whatever. So the first part of the process is to create that brief, that strategic naming blueprint that does two things. Number one, it gives us a guide back in the office with our creative team to develop names. Second of all, it's the lens through which a client should evaluate a name. Naming is so subjective and it's important that they have a strategic framework to evaluate names. And Jonathan, how much, uh, to, to what degree do you take the lead on creating that versus giving it as a, a template, so to speak, for the client to fill out? Or does it really just depend on the client and the situation? Um, it's definitely a collaborative process. I mean, mm -hmm. I think by and large, if we get a little bit of information from the client, we can put together a rough brief that we can then present to them and get their feedback on it. Um, so it's a very fast and very efficient process but it is ultimately collaborative. But, you know, we don't ask them to sort of put their signature on it. You know, you think about sort of advertising briefs when people are creating ads, they make the client actually sign off on the brief. I mean, we, we sign off in a more kind of figurative sense. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's collaborative. Okay. So that was the first step. And, and you said there were four that you think of? Yeah, the second step is then when we dive into naming. So the name creation. So we take that brief, that blueprint, and we work – with our team to develop name ideas. And, and that can involve just individual brainstorming in our offices. It could be group brainstorming where we actually sit and actually whiteboard or review ideas. 
Um, there could also be opportunities where we look back at other projects where we think, oh, that could be an interesting name that we can resurrect here. So, you know, there's a, there's a multi-part um you know, way there's 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 different ways that we you know ultimately come up with a list of names during that first round of name development, which which as you said is the second phase of the project. And I, I know that you yourself do a lot of the name generation. You also have a team of of namers. So I'll ask this both about you personally, but also want as an organization. Are there any resources that you? use frequently or, or that you like to have handy, whether they're books or websites, any, anything you go to on naming assignments to inform the process? As far as actually developing names, you're right. I mean, I'd still love to develop ideas and I want to make sure that I have time to contribute ideas as much as everyone else. And we're pretty democratic about where the ideas come from. But, you know, I, for me, my most productive time is first thing in the morning. So, you know, I'll get myself a nice strong cup of coffee, sit down with a, literally a blank sheet of paper. And, and, you know, I like to use paper and pen to actually mm. sort of craft name ideas. And I don't want to look initially at sort of old names that we did for a client maybe a year ago, even if it's in the category. I don't want to really start looking up, um, you know, start looking around, you know, concepts and 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 references online. For me, it's about the brief, a pen, and a piece of paper, and you get started. I mean, I, I guess I'm a little bit old school in that respect. <laughs> How long do you feel like you usually stick to that that minimalism of the brief and a pen and a piece of paper before you do go to some of the other um, the other paths, like going online or starting to open up some books? Um, it depends how busy and how distracted I am, <laughs> but, but I think, you know, about the max is about 90 minutes, but yeah. I mean, you can just knock out so many names there and I'm, I'm really, you know, fastidious about not checking things. Even if I think I've come up with a good idea, I don't want to sort of, cause the minute you go online or you start to check something and it's so tempting and so easy to go into the USPTO or even just run a Google check just to see if there's something out there. The minute you get online, you've removed yourself from that creative mode. Right. And I try to encourage my team to sort of follow a similar path. That's a great piece of advice that I haven't really heard. I think I've kind of come to the same conclusion myself, but never heard it articulated that you have to you have to sort of pretend that everything's going to be available at first or, or just keep, keep working without worrying about it um, and really prevent yourself from doing any of those checks. Yeah, I mean, some of my team will present names to me in an Excel document and it drives me nuts because it just it just looks so dull and mechanical. I'd rather see some sketched out ideas. And, you know, when, when, I, when actually we sit down and do stuff, I take a, like a little sort of, you know, set of index cards and anything we like, we actually write it down and we put it on the table. And I think that tactile way of shortlisting and, and thinking about, you know, and you can, you know, if someone disagrees, you just take it off the table. It becomes a more interactive um, approach before you start to sort of, you know, craft that, you know, inevitable keynote or PowerPoint presentation. Is there, is there anything that you use to get past writer's block if, if that happens to you or anything that you recommend to your team, sort of special tips or tricks when you get stuck on a project? Well, I think it's a great question. I mean, you got to take a break. You got to shift, you know, position. I mean, you can't force creativity. Um, you know, there's times when we've been sort of, you know, sitting through a, a review meeting at, you know, four thirty, five o'clock in the day. And, you know, you're just not really feeling the love on some of the ideas. So you've just got to put it to one side. And the other thing that I found that, you know, we, we call it the overnight test. So, you know, we just sort of leave things and then we come back in the morning and see how things are sitting. It may well be an idea that we were less enamored with, you know, at five o'clock yesterday afternoon. Suddenly it looks really good. Equally, something that we thought was the complete winner, you know, we might just find that we may have remember that there's, you know, another name out there, perhaps in a different category that could knock it out or, or we just decide for strategic reasons, it's not going to work, work, work as well as something else. Well, let's, let's get back. I want to make sure I don't forget to ask about the, the, the other steps in the process. So we kind of stopped at step two, which is generation, but just really quickly, what are those other uh, steps three and four that, that you think of to round out the naming process? Yeah. Well, steps three and four, you know, step three is really the the second round of name creation, right, where you start to really focus in on the things that the client said they liked in that in that first round meeting, 
right at the end of phase two. So it's a more focused uh, set of name generation. But I think that it's important to know that that first meeting with a client where you're presenting ideas is a really important strategic meeting. The goal isn't necessarily to find the winner. Sometimes it happens, but it's very, very rare. Uh, mm-hmm. The goal is really to find where the client's comfort level is around names so that you can drill down on concepts and further names um, of those types for, for, the, for, the, for the round two name, which is phase three. And then phase four is, is the due diligence phase where you could be doing you know, more detail, in-depth in trademark searches beyond what were done prior you know, each of those two formal name presentation rounds and then you might do things like linguistic checks we've got a whole process for that too especially for for global or international projects i want to ask about presenting names i i've had the pleasure of watching you present some name ideas before which i I really think you're great at and so i'm wondering if you can share anything about how you present name ideas are there do's and don'ts that you uh, abide by or that you uh that you recommend to i don't know other members of your team when they're presenting names you know putting together a very powerful presentation where you can build story and rationale for each of the names and why you think they work we tend to develop sort of a just a sort of generic graphic page where we show all the names in the same font uh, but but sort of surround them with some sort of wallpaper or imagery that reflects what the brand or, or, or company or product is about we don't develop unique graphic looks for each of the names because i think that 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 serves to distract the client and doesn't, you know, gets them to focus on the design and not the name. So I'm not a fan of doing that. But if you can be in person, you you know, you've got to see what people's reactions and, and you know, body language is critical when you, because you can tell if people are engaged and interested yeah. in ideas when you actually, you know, see them in the flesh. Um, but, you know, we've done things like, you know, where we've, we've mocked up a business card or we've, you know, kind of recreated a Wall Street Journal headline and then actually put the name in there. Um, You know, by giving a real context to the name, it helps to see it as more than something as just, you know, black type, you know, on on, on a white page that's seven or eight letters long. What about um, any mistakes that you see uh, newer namers making or or even your clients maybe before they've come to you? Are there consistent pitfalls or or mistakes that you see them making um good question i mean you know one of the first questions you've got to ask a client is who needs to be involved who are the stakeholders um if you're naming uh something that's like a new company clearly you've got to engage a ceo at some point in the process um you know i've been fortunate to do a lot of work in the cruise line industry and royal caribbean has been a a client for six years now and and naming cruise ships is a you know a massive uh, part of the business and something that the both the chairman and 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 ceo of royal caribbean are actively involved in and and so by what we what we were able to do with those guys was actually just sit down and have a conversation at the very beginning of the naming project just to understand some of the things that they were thinking of any sort of you know watch outs and so forth and by doing so, it allowed us a degree of engagement with them so that when we saw them six weeks later to present the final names, they remembered us from the initial um, meeting to sort of discuss name types in the first place. And it, it allows there to be a sort of, a, you know, a personal connection for a personal connection to be made. Now, not every naming project requires a sit down with the CEO or the senior most person, but but it's important to understand some of those nuances and peculiarities and p- politics, I guess, right? Because, you know, there are certain people that don't care about the name. If, you, if you're naming a new, you know, toothpaste at P&G, you know, it's really the brand management team that really care about it. It's, you know, you don't, you're not, not normally going up to the CEO to, 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 to get clearance or something like that. So understanding stakeholders is really important. And I think sometimes there is a naivete among clients and they don't do that homework. And then they'll go in to talk to their boss and say, hey, you know, remember that naming project we're working on? Well, we've got a name and this is what it is. And they fire off an email or something or they just very casually walk into their office. And, you know, the the best reaction you're going to get is, uh, yeah, it's okay. What else did you come up with? So again, <laughs> managing that process is really, really critical. Yeah. And the worst reaction you're going to get is I could have come up with something better. <laughs> exactly. But, but let me let me ask, let me just make one other point about mistakes because 
I've been in this business 30 years. It's, it's a long time. And, and it's still, it, it, it still amazes me that there are clients who think they can do this themselves. You know, I always say that, you know, look, naming is a real paradox. It's either, it's either the easiest thing in the world or it's the hardest thing in the world. <laughs> but it, it amazes me that, that, that clients don't sort of almost don't respect and appreciate that there is a real value in, in working with an expert on this. And they, they often make mistakes and they're often behind the eight ball. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times we get phone calls from clients saying, yeah, we need this yesterday because we should have launched this two weeks ago or this is holding up our whole you know, launch program. Um, you know, it's really amazing. What about trends in naming as, a, as an industry or, or as a process? Is there anything that you've noticed in the arc of your career or that you've seen recently that you think is, is changing or suggest a future change in how naming will be done? Right. Um, good question. I mean, I've seen a lot of trends, you know, of course, back in 1999, there was a massive, uh, you know, concern around securing the dot com, you know, the, you know, the, the sort of during those sort of nascent times in the in the Internet. And um, there's a lot less concern about owning a URL today because, of course, there's a lot more choices in terms of generic top level domains. And this little thing on, on on web browsers where you've got a little inset box and you just type in the name into Google. You don't type the name straight into the URL bar as you did, you know, almost 20 years ago. So I think there's been a sort of shift there. Um, I think things like apps, you know, there's a lot more concern now about making sure that it's free and clear in the app store and, and a bit less concerned about, you know, whether it's own, ownable as a trademark. Um as far as other things, I think there is something interesting, which is the notion of disruption in our industry, right? Because, you know, there are now things like these websites like Brandpa and Brand Bucket that are sort of cropping up where these companies are selling URLs to go and designing a logo that goes with it. And so it looks like it's an off the shelf brand ready to buy. And there's a real kind of caveat emptor moment, I think, with these things because these names have not been trademark screened and companies can spend thousands of dollars on what they think is like an off-the-shelf, ready-to-go brand and then discover that the, 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 the URL and the name that they wanted to buy isn't available. Um, there's also uh, companies like Squad Help out there that are doing sort of a – What's the expression? It's um, you know, when it's like a crowdsourced right. naming approach. You know, I guess it's like ninety nine designs or one of those kind of things. Um, but you know, I'm not too worried about those concepts because I think the key with naming is really holding the client through the process. I always say that you know, our job isn't to create a name; is to help you pick one. And it's very hard for clients to just pick a name off the bat off one of these sites or just to see a list of 300 ideas and for one of them to have a eureka moment. So our value goes way beyond creative output. It go, it, it bec you become part psychologist, part <laughs> mentor, um, and that's really where our experience allows us to achieve the success that we've had. Right. Clearly, I'd, we'd love to pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, we're brilliant namers and we're really creative and we come up with cool stuff. But the reason, the ultimate reason why I think we've been able to build a successful business is because we've helped the client. We've walked them through the process. We've listened to them. We've applied the right balance of leadership and collaboration to ultimately and factor in the legal and, and other, you know, stakeholder buy in issues and all that kind of stuff. All those things contribute to the ability to pick a name and to go with it and to go out and start doing business with it. One question I like to end on, which is uh, you've been doing this for 30 years. I'm just curious, why do you do it? What is your favorite thing about doing it, about naming? Um, good question. I mean, you know, this was a business I sort of fell into. Um mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to do a summer internship at Interbrand in 1989. And, you know, I just sort of fell in love with the whole idea of naming. I liked the creativity of it. I liked the marketing aspects of it. I liked where naming fits in the continuum of brand development. 
Um, there's a lot of things I like about it. I mean, I like the creative aspects to it. I like the fact that, you know, this is about, it, it's the, it's this need to sell a name, not in a kind of a car salesman type of way, but to convince someone to believe in something that you think could be a powerful, you know, possibly the most valuable asset in a company. So I think that's really exciting. I think the diversity of the work that we do, um, we just won a project in Russia, of all places, believe it or not. And just the, you know, what's amazing is that you get back to work on January 2nd and you just never know where you're going to be going in the US, in the world or wherever and what kind of projects you're going to be working on. There's so much diversity uh, to the work that we do and it never is dull. Are you traveling to Russia for that? I am. I am. Well, I'm trying to get a visa, so we'll see if that comes through. <laughs> that sounds exciting. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for making time to to join me. Thanks, Rob. That was great. We'll talk soon, all right? All right. Sounds good. Good talking to you. Cool, man. Cheers. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to How Brands Are Built. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave a rating and review on iTunes. I'd love to hear from you. You can also follow us online. We're on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and visit us online at howbrandsarebuilt.com, where you can check out notes from this show, uh, as well as a full transcript, articles, and blog posts. You can sign up for a newsletter, and you can get in touch if you have any questions or suggestions for the show. And while you're at howbrandsarebuilt.com, do check out Jonathan's TED Talk. We'll post a video there. How Brands Are Built is a production of Heirloom Agency, LLC. Our theme music is by Isha Erskine Project. I'm Rob Meyerson, and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks again.